Hello and welcome to another edition of Bridging Chicago podcast. My name is Joseph Amari and I am an associate attorney at SATC Law. And I'm grateful today to be joined by Kyle Prater, CEO and founder of Chasing Greatness Productions. Kyle, how are you doing today? How are you doing, boss? Nice. Thank you guys for having me. Appreciate being here. Yeah, thank you for joining us. We're excited to hear about your story. Now, Kyle is a is the CEO of Chasing Greatness Productions. He is a graduate of uh, Proviso West and later Northwestern University. Uh, Kyle, could you tell us a little bit about your background? Uh, my background, you know, before I, you know, got into, you know, starting my production company, you know, I was originally, you know, an athlete, still an athlete, but, you know, I played professional football. Uh, football's been, you know, part of my life, my entire life, you know, started off playing football at seven years old. Uh, Pop Warner went to high school, played at Proviso West. From Proviso West, went to University of Southern Cal in L.A. Went from L.A. to Northwestern, had some injuries that, uh, you know, that, that followed my career all the way up to Northwestern. Then I got an opportunity to play in the NFL with the Saints uh, for a few years. And, you know, now led me to a retired, now I'm a, you know, filmmaker, you know, entrepreneur, director, producer uh, with my own company. So it's a, it's a long little journey to get where I was at. Absolutely. And I read a little bit about your dad being an avid football fan as well, right? Yeah, he was. He was. Still is. Still is. A big encouragement for you, I'm sure, along the process. Yeah, yeah. He's always been a big supporter, always firm believer in everything I've done. So what were some of the biggest things that you learned going through that athletic process through high school and college? I'm sure the expectations are pretty enormous as you got you know further and further in your career. Yeah, I mean, I've always dealt with expectations um, throughout high school, especially with, you know, being uh, labeled as the number one player in the nation coming out of high school in my position and just dealing with, you know, just the world pressures as to just that's what comes with it, you know. And so, you know, just dealing with that, you know, I think that put a lot of pressure on me at a young age to have to, like, live up to those expectations, with, which, you know, caused injuries because you was trying to overwork and, Mm-hmm. things of that nature so but it was a learning process and it was uh, it was good for me to kind of like go through that to kind of set me up for where I'm at today sure and what what advice would you give to a young athlete who's facing similar expectations what kind of things did you learn when you were dealing with that uh what I've learned is you know well from now with my mindset now is to like you can't focus on other people's expectations just the expectations you set for yourself um, a lot of times people will live vicariously through you, um, through your, for their dreams, you know what I'm saying? But um, mm-hmm. my, my dreams and everything were for me, not for everybody else. So you got to look at it for yourself and not looking at what others think about you and other people's opinions. Absolutely. I think that what you said is absolutely correct. You know, we have to be our own barometers of success, and especially with our relationship with sports in this country. You know, uh, most athletes tend to be people's idols and to have that many people expecting so much, it, it can definitely be a weight, but setting your own goals and metrics of success is huge to creating your own path. Yeah, hundred percent. I think um, once you get to the point in life where you are just focusing on you and yourself and what your life's calling is and what God intended for you, what the universe is telling you to do, then uh, you'll start to see things kind of just fall in your lap, fall into place, almost like a puzzle uh that is just being put in place for you so it's uh it's pretty cool to see but you got to go through adversity you got to go through trials and tribulations and life experiences to kind of get to that place of maturity to kind of like be at that level it's ongoing though it's an ongoing process absolutely i i always see this visual representation of the path to success and it's that it's not you know linear up and to the right there's peaks and valleys and those lower times, they help you to appreciate when you get to the top. Mm-hmm. Um, so what was that moment for you when you realized that the visual arts were a passion for you? When did that start to come about? Uh, 2016 was my last year uh, where I got released with the Saints. And in November of 2016, I picked up a camera just to like, in my spare time while I was still trying to, you know, figure out if I was going to like, get an opportunity with other teams, you know, still getting calls from my agent by the opportunities, but I wanted to have something to do in between time. And I, I was just taking pictures and photos, you know, my sister and the forest preserve. And then I started doing small side projects 
um, just for fun. But then I noticed that it wasn't it wasn't just for fun. It was something that was fun, but also something that I love to do. And mm. it became a part of me. And now it's a part of my everyday lifestyle. It's creating and storytelling, uh, directing and, you know, looking back at it, you never thought I'd be this far. But I mean, I kind of knew I would be in this position because of my work ethic and how I got to where I got to in the NFL and just the work that I had to put in to get to a place to get in the NFL after all the injuries because it was constant work. I always knew how to work. I never shied away from putting in the work. I love the process of everything. I love seeing things grow and culminate. And that's what this process of being a, a creative was to where I'm at now. And were you exposed to the visual arts a little bit in your studies at USC and then Northwestern? Yeah, I was exposed to it, but I wasn't um, invested in it like I am now. I wish I would have been invested in it um, as if, well, I wish I was more invested in it then like I am now because I'd probably be a more of a leg up. But mm-hmm. um, if I was to tell any kid that's in college or in, you know, playing for a team in college to like take classes that you will apply after football or after sport, just anything, because we take a lot of classes just to be eligible to play and right. just to be on the field. And a lot of times it's like, I wish I would have took classes that I can apply in everyday life, which I did a few, but I wish I would have took more, uh, you know, behind the scenes as far as like filmmaking and directing and which now I'm learning on my own, which is great because you have to really just take those baby steps again mm-hmm. and really be patient with yourself with relearning. But um, again, to have that extra leg up, I would have took classes in my in my respective colleges. Sure. I I had some friends. I went to the University of Illinois for my undergraduate, and I had some friends on the football team. And I think what often people don't realize is being a, a member of a team, the commitment is like a full-time job on top of your education. You know, your weeks are so regiment, regimented. You know, you're waking up at 6 a.m. to go get a workout in before class studying going to any academic programs the team has it's i'm sure a lot to handle on top of you know just being an uh, undergraduate student trying to get your education and move through it no it's a lot i mean juggling sport classes um you know being playing at a high level and playing at a school that's that requires so much university of southern cal northwest two prestigious schools Mm -hmm. um injuries, rehab, you know, you got to go to therapy. It's all these things that I had to go through. Mm-hmm. But like you said, regimented, you know, I was so used, I'm still used to being regimented, which I implement that same type of, you know, process with my business, you know, because as athletes, we always, we're so used to being regimented, 6 a.m. wake up, meetings, class, practice, meetings, class, practice all throughout our days. So that becomes like our lifestyle for life. Right. So, like, how do you transition after that once it's done? Do you take that away or do you kind of just re-implement, re-implement that into your, your lifestyle, your new lifestyle, which I did? It's just like the, you know, different playbook, uh, same terminology. Absolutely. My dad always said something that's a little cheesy, but he'd say nothing succeeds like success. And I'd always notice when I gave that hard work and discipline, when I followed that path, even if it didn't pay off right away, as the steps went, I started to feel, okay, I'm working, I'm moving right. towards something, it's moving in that direction. So yeah, you might not see your, it now. Absolutely. So what was your first project with Chasing Greatness Productions? Uh, my first project that came about was, man, 2017 was officially Chasing Greatness came to life, was birthed. But one of my biggest projects, first project was with Nike. Mm-hmm. Um, it's Chicago 2018 with Kevin Durant and oh, wow. Spice and Spice Adams shot this piece, this short, short little short story we did with Nike in Chicago about uh, Kevin Durant hosting this, uh, the EYBL he did, he did every year over mm-hmm. here with uh, the McCormick Place with the girls. And then we had Spice Adams come in to play Kareem Bigham's because, you know, he's an internet sensation. So we did a storyline behind that with Kareem Biggums finally meeting Kevin Durant and trying to get an opportunity to play basketball. So we put a storyline behind that. So that was one of that was my first project um, with Chasing Greatness Productions. You know, from there, I kind of knew that I was built for it because mm-hmm. the athlete connection, meeting KD, he knew automatically, like, 
uh, that connection, just knowing athletes, you know, that's what I've been blessed to just be able to meet these athletes where they're at and be able to work with them and like give them more than just uh, your everyday director that might not know what that athlete's going through because again, like I play sport. So it's like I, the relatability factor is different. So um, since then it's just been a blessing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what were some of the challenges when you were making that first project that you didn't quite see coming that you had to work through? Uh, one of the things I think was uh, working with talent of that magnitude. You get a lot of people you got to work through. Um, his mm -hmm. team, um, you got a lot of people that's within the Nike uh, department that is not just one person. It's a lot of red tape. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of overhead. It's a lot of cooks in the kitchen. So I've <laughs> learned that. I learned that process that like it's my vision, but at the same time, it, it's going to get cut down. It's going to get like you know, kind of torn down, you know, to, to a degree, but you still got to bring the vision to life. So uh, just working, being able to work with other people, um, um, being able to just, being able to like cut out all that middleman stuff has been like, you know, a process too, but it's all good. Right. The administrative side of things sometimes can be as cumbersome as actually going out there and producing, I'm sure. Right. So I noticed your uh, Chasing Greatness's motto is films that inspire greatness in all its forms. How would you say that you define greatness and what kind of forms have you seen in your work? Uh, how I define greatness, man, is I think my company is called Chasing Greatness for a reason because you got always, we're, gonna, we're always striving for something. We never made it. We're never going to be there. I feel like it's something I always want to keep it, trying to strive for. We all have something we're striving for. Whether you feel like you made it or not, there's always room to grow. And mm -hmm. with our films and projects, I always want people to get hope from it and pull something from it, you know, I want them to see themselves, you know, so, um, you know, I feel like it's my duty to create films that tell the truth and speak to people and speak to the culture and push us forward, you know, and, and something that got substance, something that they can, like, take away, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I think, I think that if you have a desire to be great, you understand, like you're saying, you understand that it's never achieving that pinnacle there's always more i think michael jordan was saying in the last dance that there were still things he's working on his last right. season you know even if you're at that top there's always room to improve and i think only when you think that you've made it and there is no improvement left is when you know maybe apathy starts to set in a little bit so when you meet with uh you know a prospective client or someone that wants to tell their story when you guys talk about you know portraying it what kind of aspects do you go over with them uh, it's funny you asked that. We just did a project, just shot the last few days, uh, three days shoot with a company, a startup company called M2N, uh, Eric Stanley, uh, Christy, and KJ and Arasi. These are people that are starting up a company and they want to tell their story from a lived experience standpoint. And they're trying to show diversity and inclusion on another level in which, you know, all the of these corporate companies, you know, trying to show diversity and inclusion, but they're not really are living it. And so mm -hmm. uh, with us, with the client coming in, what their needs is, is basically want to show themselves in another uh, realm and sense of like vulnerability. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about their lived experience, talking about being a minority, talking about uh, their lived experiences at other companies when they didn't have diversity and inclusion and now having it within their minority uh, their M2N company. So just, you know, basically coming to me and basically we sit down, we vet, we go over questions, we have a conversation just like me and you are, but the mm -hmm. cameras are rolling and <laughs> and then it's just, you know, we, we pull from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you go back and forth? I'm sure there's some uh, gap between when you guys have that initial conversation and I'm sure there's back and forth about how we're going to set up and then your vision for how this is going to be portrayed visually. Do you feel that working with a company like that, you have to kind of uh, put it in terms that someone that might not have a visual background uh, needs to hear to understand what your vision is? Yeah. And, and what, what comes with that is, you know, if a, a company can't see it verbally, you know, we put it together visually in a deck or a treatment. I create my treatments and decks um, all from the ground up, each one, each client, each brand I work with, we build out this uh, PDF slash presentation of mm -hmm. just of what the or what the film or commercial or piece is going to look like 
before it's even done. And then we talk, we talk through it. We speak it. We speak to it um, from a, a narrative standpoint, storyboard it, and uh, we go from there. Um, it, it's just basically just everything I do. I'm visual. Like I see things. Like when I played ball, I saw routes done before they weren't done. When I got to the line of scrimmage, I saw the release, the play done before I even done it because I had practiced it, I had done it. It's just the same thing with film and my projects and, and creating It's like, I'm talking to the client, but I've already know what it looks like. It's done already in my head. Post production's right. already done in my head. And so that's basically for me, I put it into this, this treatment and then from there I speak to it and then we shoot it and we edit it and then it comes out like the way it was in my head. And so I think that's a blessing. I think, again, like, did I know that I was going to be doing this, playing football and being a number one player in the nation? No, but the way the universe worked for me was like, mm-hmm. all right, man, this is what you're going to be doing. And I haven't shot away from it since, you know? So, right. Sometimes the path reveals itself to you and, uh, you know, you follow follow what the universe is presenting. A hundred. hundred and ten percent. Do you have any directors that inspire you that you've you know, used to try and model your work after? Uh, of course, you know, I, I love Spike Lee. Uh, one of the, the guys that are like I'm close to in age that I watch heavily and closely is our, our guy by the name of Riley Robbins. He's mm-hmm. in Los, he's in Los Angeles. He's a great director. Uh, I kind of feel like we kind of like similar in storytelling and how we we lead and how we direct and how we coach our talent and and everybody on set. But I just think I watch everybody and I try to like like Kobe watch Jordan, you know, how LeBron watch all the greats and how they, you know, pull from each person and to make Mm -hmm. their own style. And I think that's what I'm doing is just like I pull, I watch, but necessarily don't steal. But it's like you tailor it to your own being, you know, and I think that's what I've I've been doing these past couple of years. Add your own, add your own ideas into that product. Yeah, my own flavor, my own style, my way of, you know, doing it. You know, I, and I think for me, that's being able to relate to people and meet them where they're at, and mm-hmm. and that's how you get the best out of your talent and your crew and everybody because you're able to just connect. That relatability factor is like key when it comes down to storytelling and creating the films that we do. Sure. So we go a little bit into the background for our listeners that might not be familiar. Could you take us through what a typical shoot looks like from beginning to end, starting with the production? Uh, so f- uh, first of all, we just talked about how the treatment and the decks are built out. Calls are made that we have pre-calls. We have pre-pro calls that goes over the treatment and deck. We go over with the client or the brand mm-hmm. or whoever that uh, talent is to go over the shoot. From that point, we set the shoot date. We get location scouts to get out the locations, whether that's permits needed, we get all that. Or if we, if we guerrilla shoot and we just out there shooting and we figuring it out um, dates and times. But on the day of the shoot, um, it's, you know, the crew meets up. Um, the equipment setup takes about an hour. We need about an hour and a half to, like, get everything set up with, for the interviews or whether that's a scene we're trying to cre- uh, create or recreate. Um, that takes about an hour. And then once we start shooting, some typical shoot days take about a whole day, depending on the, the scope, you know, of the project mm-hmm. or what we're doing. But a lot of my shoots be day shoots, a whole day, you know, mm-hmm. it's a whole day process. And then the post-production, I'm sure, is pretty intricate as well. Probably the most important part. It's probably the most important part. You know, I think being for me, in this space of director. And I, I kind of say I wear all the hats, but my main hat is the filmmaker director. But uh, over the years, I've worn all the hats, the main hat, which is editing, editing all the films so they can look the way I want it to. And by doing that, you get to the point where you can delegate that work to other people and you know how you want it to look because you've worn that hat. So can't mm-hmm. nobody be coming here and be like, well, it should look this way or try to get over on me because I wore the hat, so <clears throat> come on. Like, so I know what right. it looks like. And I and I, I demand that from people around me on my team. I'm, I'm like, my energy is very demanding in a sense of like, not aggressive, but it's like, you know, they know I, they know I know the hats that they're wearing. So they right. step up to the plate and deliver. And it's, it's fun, you know, but you know, it's not in a way that's daunting. Like, man, I gotta, 
you know, like this dude, <laughs> KP, is intense. But right. like, it's that type of intense that's like infectious. Like you want to be around this guy because like I'm gonna motivate you. I'm, I'm, I'm inspiring you because again, like how am I doing this? I don't know to some people's eyes it's like I am doing it. And that's like to have success where I'm at. When we talked about success is different in everybody's eyes. My success is like, I don't care about going viral. Like I ain't. <clears throat> Like if I go viral, I go viral. But you know, the, a lot of times my, mm-hmm. my my films and things that I create is sometimes too real or sometimes it's too true. Mm-hmm. And the world we live in don't really want, the truth sometimes is overlooked and sometimes it's swept under the rug. We want to be massaged. We want to be, we want you know what I'm saying? We want to, you know, fabricate our messaging so we can like make it look good when really the truth is like hurt sometimes. And yeah. that's, the, that's the world we live in. So. I don't shy away from my, my storytelling. I just try to stay, remain true who I am. And um, I attract those people or projects that I stay within alignment with, you know? Absolutely. You mentioned <clears throat> earlier authenticity and storytelling. And I think that's exactly, you know, the key to, sometimes it isn't comfortable to get that authenticity, but the world sometimes isn't comfortable. And I think to come together and understand someone's story, they have to be willing to be uncomfortable to really empathize and understand. And two, I wanted to ask you, you're talking a lot about your leadership. What, what aspects do you make a great leader? Uh, I think what makes me a great leader is I lead by example. I don't, I don't talk about it. I just do. Mm -hmm. And if I, if I am talking about it, best believe I'm backing it up. Um, Well, I'm a man of my word. I just, you know, I just stay authentic. And I think when people see that, um somebody being true and real and not trying to be somebody else that they're not you want to follow behind that because that gives them inspiration and motivation to be themselves in this space because this world is so like i got to keep up with the jones i got to get this i got to do that instagram social media keeping up following other people's lives you gotta so it's like it's hard you know to lead in that space when there's so many like things you gotta look at so Mm -hmm. um I think my biggest trait is just staying, remaining who I am, you know, living in my truth and just being who I am. And, you know, I think that's the best quality trait I can have. So going forward, what what kind of uh, things do you envision for the future of Chasing Greatness? Do you have any projects underway that you're excited to get out or in a longer term, do you see yourself branching and working with uh, different companies to make ad space? Yeah, I do. I do. I was talking about this the other a few weeks ago about working with other brands, other companies, you know, playing well in the sandbox. I know brands don't play well in the sandbox with other brands, but like I do, you know, I want to, you know, I want to tell stories with other brands, other clients. Uh, We are working, like I just mentioned, the company M2N we just shot this past week. Um, Samples of Life, I just finished the film that we just did that talks a lot about what we're talking about, um, authenticity just being yourself, um, the pandemic. But uh, yeah, I mean, I want to work with other brands. I want to tell these stories, you know, Shifting Gears is a series that's being shopped around um, Mm -hmm. in LA. Um, Yeah, I just want to tell this story on a bigger scale, you know, get into Netflix, get into theaters, um, and really get people to like tap into themselves on another level. I think it's a space that's not touched enough vulnerability. And I think I'm, I'm on the right path to like bringing that back to the forefront. Absolutely. I, I think that's uh, very underemphasized, but important when you're saying this word vulnerability, I think oftentimes people can be scared to be vulnerable because when you make yourself vulnerable, you're exposing a part of yourself that maybe you're not comfortable with, but I think real strength comes with saying, here's something about my life that's difficult and I'm willing to share it so that others can understand me rather than painting this picture of, oh, I have, I have no concerns. I'm not scared of anything. Well, we all have our fears. We all have the things that are difficult for us and to open them up, especially in a visual space like that takes a lot of strength, a lot of strength. Yeah, it does take strength. I mean, like I said, uh, I'm, I've gotten to the point where like, I'm not afraid to talk about things that we weren't supposed to talk to talk about at the table, kitchen table, or, you know, those, those conversations that were like frowned upon, I'm able to bring it to the forefront and talk about it, be vulnerable. 
Um, mm-hmm. I talked about my addiction with pain pills in college and throughout my career with my injuries. And I pulled and gained so much strength from that and so many other people too as well. So you never know what what person or any, you never know what you're going through and how much it can impact and inspire some other, somebody else when you talk about it, especially in a film or a book or just in open and public Mm-hmm. because we all are like half skeletons in our closet, but a lot of times we don't reveal them because we're too busy worrying about what people are going to think and the opinions of others. But again, like I said, I pull strength from it, you know, and I think other people do as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. That you mentioned the pain pills, and I think we've seen that recently as it's come to light, how pervasive that issue has been in America. But for so long, it was it was so commonplace for a doctor, any kind of pain, all right, here's some pills for it. Not thinking about the long-term effects of that and how many people, you know, they would think, okay, I have a little injury, take this. And all of a sudden, any other pain, they start to need it and they become used to this life without pain. Was that, was recovering from that addiction difficult for you? Uh, Yeah, it was. I think, you know, I, I talk about this openly because I think every time I talk about it, it just, again, furthers or removes that, that part of me away from me. But uh, 2010 to like 2014, um, just my my whole career, I was getting like shots to play. I was in pain and to like cope with a lot of times I'm not playing, I would just take pain medicine. I would take hydrocodone, I would take Viking, and I would take whatever I had prescribed to me. And it was like you said, it was given to you just like candy as athletes. Um, We got that stuff, we asked for it. And again, we abused it. Um, It's just, you know, at that time, I didn't know. You're not, you young, you don't know, you're in college, you're trying to uh, appease to your teammates because certain guys are doing it. And it was looked at as cool and people abuse it. You know, people have fun on it. So that, for me, um, having to remove myself from that, get clean, cold turkey, my family was there to support me, but I went through withdrawals and that that time was hard, you know, because uh, ridding your body from those things that you was doing all the time your body has adverse effects and again like today i'm blessed and fortunate enough to be in a space where i'm not uh using controlled substances Mm -hmm. and you know so it's just it's a a blessing but again this is a lot of people's story you know so again that's why i made the film and talked about it because opioid addiction is heavy even more so today post well pre-pandemic post-pandemic still the pandemic Mm -hmm. you know you, you try to run from the reality but mm-hmm. that same problem still going to be there. And if anything, it's going to make it worse down the road. Absolutely. So, uh, so yeah. Yeah, I, I think about that. We oftentimes, as fans, <laughs> expect our sports heroes, our, our team, to be supermen. We expect them, Paul, play through it. You know, guy gets hurt, play through it. We need you. We need you to perform. But I think if not humanizing a person, you know, that person's in pain. They're trying to perform. They're trying to be great. There's a lot of competition, so they feel that pressure. It's coming through in a plethora of ways. So I can see, especially for young athletes, how important that is that you're getting your message out there and letting them know, hey, we can talk about this. We can talk about, well, what's the ramifications of these decisions? Yeah, and I think uh, I think more coaches and trainers need to be uh, cognizant of their players when they're not playing and from the mental health standpoint. Because aside from like the physical, it played more part, more effect. It affected me more mentally than it did physically. Because mm. you take you taking me away from a sport that I worked my ass off my whole life for to get here, and now I'm not doing it. And they look at you differently. The locker room looks at you differently when you're hurt. No one plays the game to get hurt. <clears throat> so right. when you're in that locker room, everybody knows this. Any, any athlete can attest. The way they look at you, your teammates, is like without even saying anything, it's the type of energy they give you when you're not playing. It's like, you on the sideline again? Like, are you hurt? And it's like, it's a look, it's a, it's a vibe, it's a, you know what I'm saying? It's like, mm-hmm. um, you know, you, you the only athletes that been in this position understand, and it's not a good feeling because you know you want to play. And right. then again, and what that does, it puts you in a position to take pain pills to play while still being hurt or right. force yourself to play when you're really not ready and then you end up hurting something else and you compensate. 
So right. it's just, it's this trickle down. It's like this domino effect of just like emotions. Just like man, it's hard, mm-hmm. and that's what that's what the athletes be. That's where we be at mentally. So I'm just trying to bridge that gap. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. we talking about bridging Chicago. This this interview is like bridging that gap mm-hmm. between athletes and and their emotions when it comes down to like being in spaces like that. Absolutely. I, I mean, I'm glad you said this because it's. I think it's so important that we view our athletes as people, but we view everyone as people, understand the circumstances, have a little bit more compassion to understand how someone can end up in that space, especially with your specific situation. When you got teammates, you got coaches, everyone's like, we need you, you know, Kyle, we need you, but you know that you're compromising long-term health for that. That's a tough spot to be in. So I think it's important. I hope that someone in that position that's younger can look at that and listen to you and be inspired to, you know, think very critically about what they're doing and where their health is at. So moving, moving back to chasing greatness, do you, do you have any projects now that you want to promote and tell people about that you're excited about working on? Uh, right now, uh, we just finished up samples of life. Uh, I think people should, if they haven't seen it, it's on my website, chasing It's the link in my bio on our Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, it's streaming now online for everybody to view. And, you know, from there, uh, we just did a project, uh, shot a commercial, directed a commercial for Champs in East Bay for their national campaign of them emerging with officially tying, you know, brands, East Bay and Champs together. Um, mm-hmm. So we just did that piece. It just released last week. So I was excited about that uh, to be working and been working with Champs in East Bay for a couple of years now. So, um, yeah, man, it's, it's so many so many things coming up. On the, We've been really busy. I'm just mm-hmm. hoping... Uh, you know, samples of life can really, you know, get the attention that I feel like it deserves. Absolutely. So we've talked a lot about, you know, you as a professional, but a little bit about you as a person, what kind of hobbies are you into? How you spend your time outside of uh, chasing greatness? I make music. I love music, man. I love, I love sampling. I love just making music and hearing different sounds, different oldies, different, um, I love hearing music that like that has been sampled. That's probably one of your favorite songs. I love chopping it up mm-hmm. uh, because that's what I did in the Samples of Life film. Uh, it was basically just uh, I narrated me making music, but also talked about me being in the space of uh, the pandemic and catching COVID and going through those things and having to like overcome being isolated because we all was isolated during the pandemic, but I pulled a lot of strength and found creativity there. So um, I love for music and, 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 and making music and rapping sometimes. I do a lot of stuff, you know, that's, that keeps me away from work because I'm, I'd be pretty busy. Mm-hmm. So when you say you wear all the hats, you mean all the hats, <laughs> if you're making the music, editing, everything, that's pretty yeah. impressive. How did you yeah. go about learning, learning that technical background just, picked it up or did you take any courses? I picked it up, man. I've always been a guy that could pick things up. I'm visual, I YouTube, I don't take long. It just takes me just working at it and working and getting the reps. Just like, again, I just use the same, you know, premise, you know, the mindset of like when I worked at it in football, I use the same thing in the business and and whatever I want to do. But these certain things like making music and uh, producing, I, I was blessed to be around a, a Grammy nominated producer by the name of Cosine Marcos Palacios in Los Angeles when I was at USC. I was always in the studio mm-hmm. uh, meeting guys like Big Sean, Bruno Mars, uh, Chris Brown, Seven Streeter, all these uh, artists that we all know, but I was able to be blessed to be in their presence and just watch them create. And mm-hmm. uh, I, I fell in love with it even more so then than anything so uh now i'm in the position to do it myself so it's cool absolutely well is there a best way for our listeners to be able to connect chasinggreatness.com yes uh best way is one they can check out my instagram as k2p21 and also Mm -hmm. our separate handle is cg prod that's c underscore z g underscore prod that's chasing greatness productions on instagram and our website chasinggreatnessproductions.com as well. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, Kyle, it's been absolutely wonderful talking to you today. Um, I love your story. I am excited to check you out further and I wish you all the best and all the success as you move forward. Oh man, I appreciate you all for having me. Thanks a lot, man. Appreciate it. 
All right. Thanks so much. And this has been another episode of Bridging Chicago. Uh, we hope to see you soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of Bridging Chicago as produced by the SATC Solutions Center. Nothing contained in this podcast shall constitute financial, investment, legal, and or professional advice. No professional relationship of any kind is created between you and the podcast host or guest. You are urged to speak with your financial, investment, or legal advisors before making any investment or legal decisions. Furthermore, the opinions expressed in this podcast are not necessarily the opinions of SATC Solution Center, SATC Law, or any of its employees. This podcast is created by the hosts and guests' individual capacities. All opinions on this podcast are or have been rendered based on specific facts under certain conditions and are subject to certain assumptions and may not and should not be used or relied upon for any other purpose, including, but not limited to, or use in or in connection with any investment purposes or legal proceeding.